All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for taking the time to join us this evening. Um, on behalf of Jack Leg Press, I'd like to welcome you. My name is Jen Harris, and I'm the publisher and director. And tonight, Simone Monch, our poetry editor, will be um, serving as our amazing MC, introducing everyone and sharing information about the books and whatnot. Um, we're really honestly thrilled that you could join us and we have so many great writers featured tonight. So with that, Simone, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to um, introduce each reader. And our first reader, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce, Angie Estes. Angie is the author of six books of poems, most recently Parole. Her previous book, Enchanté, won the 2015 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Prize and the Audre Lorde Prize for Lesbian Poets. And Trist was selected as one of two finalists for the 2000 2010 Pulitzer Prize. Her seventh book is forthcoming from Unbound Edition Press, and a collection of essays devoted to her work appears in the University of Michigan Press's Under Discussion series titled The Allure of Grammar, The Glamour of Angie Estes's Poetry. Please join me in welcoming Angie Estes. Thanks. It's really great to um, to meet all of you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I didn't major in technology, so I'm never quite sure what's what's happening. Um, it's wonderful. It's it's so great to be able to like bring new books of poems into the world. Um, and so I'm really happy, happy to meet you, Simone. Happy to meet Jen. Happy to meet um, all of you. Um, and to to sort of help bring in. Mamie Morgan's book and and um, Karen Rigby's second book. Um, I've actually known of Karen for a long time uh, because she did an amazing interview with me years ago. I can't even remember when it was, Karen. Although we've never actually met, so we're kind of kind of meeting now. Um, and great also to be reading with with Emma. So thanks very much to everyone for for coming. Um, I'm just going to read three poems. Um, I thought it might be fun to read um, the first poem from my first book, um, which was so long ago, I can't even quite remember if I've ever read it. Um, but here it is. A poem called Lost at Sea. I always wanted to write a poem called Lost at Sea, complete with fore and aft and masts and rigging, sails I could inflate like cherubic cheeks of laundry, hoisting them off into oblivion. Then after heaving in fog for days, I and whatever reader remained would lift our heads as we rolled into imagery deep and blue, dipping our faces overboard into its dark swirling skirt. All at once, the sea would be personified and come to resemble every lover I ever knew. In the panic that followed, Line breaks of any kind would be forbidden. Everyone who threatened mutiny would be chained in the hold. And anyone caught on deck without permission, my mother, for instance, could argue her view from the gangplank while I lay on the tip of the bow, adjusting the height of the horizon. The irony of the poem would be that no one would ever cry out, land ho, because of course, we were lost at sea, tacking carelessly across the hips of the ocean, and it was night, and as in all good poems, in the depths lurked hidden meaning. One day, sun rotted, the sails would mercifully unzip, and the naked lines of a poem called Lost at Sea could finally suggest what happened, how your tongue stuck inside me like an oar, how you and your boat kept turning, turning, turning. And then this next poem is actually the first poem in the new collection that's coming out um, next, next March from Unbound. 
in the, the first line of this poem and in the next one, the first line, the title is also the first line of the poem. The swallows come out like stars wallowing in the dim evening light because in the country of blue, at times, even the borders of the heart are the borders one needs to leave. So I waited at the airport, a woman beneath a sign that said, gate B, hold. What Eloise and Abelard must have been feeling when they named their son Astrolabe, an instrument for determining one's position in the universe. The room where they met in secret was not far from Pont Neuf, the new bridge, which is the oldest bridge in Paris. And like the French grammatical liaison, it puts something hard, something voiced between two vowels, like the sound you make when I'm finally inside you. It's the way scientists knew they had discovered a new group of blue whales. And they were singing a song no one had ever heard. And this last poem I'll read <clears throat> um, is from the manuscript that's just beginning. Um, and it actually was just published in what you've probably heard was unfortunately the last issue of a Gettysburg Review, um, which is truly, truly a tragedy. Um, and again, the title is the first line of the poem. I love to think of John Cage before he was John Cage. When he landed a job leading tourists through famous places he himself had never seen. At Versailles, for example, he read a guidebook the night before and mapped out which rooms to visit, made up the stories to tell, how the royals used to ice skate in the marble courtyard, what God could see looking through the Oeil de Boeuf window into the antechamber between the king's bedroom and the queen's. And as they all walked through the Hall of Mirrors, he recited the words that Louis XIV used to say to his mistress in the Grand Trianon. We celebrated every moment of our trysts as an epiphany, long before Tarkovsky wrote them. The tourists must have felt much like I did, returning home after months in France to see that my neighbor, who died before I left, still had a sign in her front yard saying, gone solar, and to read the voicemail transcription of my old friend's midnight call, telling me she'd had a stroke. I'm having an incredible time in the hot dog world experience. That's the amazing thing about French. You can always ask, ça vous dire? What does it want to say? Is it rapture or raptures of the deep? As the tour ended, they all strolled away on the paths outside the palace, walking on tiny fragments of teeth, bone, and long gone passing meteors, now known as sediment, which we could just as easily call sentiment. Lately, I've been listening to the many recordings on YouTube of John Cage's four minutes, 33 seconds, considering how many ways there are to play nothing. Like the song the dead know by heart, not song of the day, but song if the day. Thanks. That was beautiful, Angie. I love the image of walking um, on tiny fragments of teeth and bone and the question, how many ways are there to play nothing? Yeah. Um, Fascinating. Cage is so fascinating. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and it's amazing Art. to look them up online, truly, really, and to, to, to like see how many ways there really are to play that. <laughs> yeah. Our next reader is Emma Bolden. And Emma Bolden is the author of a memoir called The Tiger and the Cage as well as the poetry collections, House is an Enigma, Meditations, and Malificae. Her work has appeared in The Best American Poetry, The Best Small Fictions, Poetry Daily, Verse Daily, and such journals as Plowshares, 
the Gettysburg Review, <laughs> um, the Seneca Review, the Rumpus, Story Quarterly, Prairie Schooner, Tri Quarterly, and Shenandoah. And she currently serves as an editor of Screen Door Review. Emma. Thank you so much, Simone. Uh, can everybody hear me? I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that too because I I mm -hmm. definitely did a major in technology <laughs> as well. Um, Angie, that was extraordinary. Uh, thank you so much. We were actually in the same issue of Gettysburg Review. Really? Um, yeah, we were. <laughs> yeah, wow. sadly, the, the last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's such an honor to be here tonight. So uh, thank you, Simone. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and I'm excited to celebrate Mamie and Karen's books. Um, I'm going to read four poems. And in celebration of new work, I'm going to, um, I've been driving myself <clears throat> insane for the past few weeks trying to put together a new collection. So I'm going to read four poems that are from that. Um, and the first one that I'm going to read is kind of the emotional spine, I guess, of the book. So, Coming of Age. Having kept a list of dangers living sick in the back of my throat, having numbered the entrances and exigencies, having taken note of the exits at both ends of the plane, knowing one is always behind me, Having kept to myself secrets, hands, a series of descriptions that include the word blood, having upbuttoned the blouse and upstitched the hem, having whittled a half inch off each pair of heels, having walked away from alleyways and toward street lamps, having learned by fist blow, by blade tooth, Having found myself at last inside and safe, and asking my door's lock if safety is a myth I have locked myself into believing in order to step from my bed. Having slid from the bed and onto my knees, and there offered the blank called God both gratitude and supplication. Having wondered if there can be gratitude without supplication. Having nonetheless given God thanks for storm clouds, sugar packets, dust mites, and silence. Having prayed the war is ending. Having prayed that the war has not yet begun. Having lost teeth and the concept of virginity. Having called the absence God and God in absence. Having raw picked the scab. Having stone packed my pockets before walking out of the river. Having thanked the night for hiding the dumb, wasted furniture of what I call a life. Having given my pleasant plans and laid down in the rain. Having noticed in the oil an iridescent spectacular. Having held a winged insect in my hand and seen on its wings the same shimmer and sheen before it asked its wings to fly again, and I stood watching. Having, after all this, no choice but to stay here, to stand and to marvel, to see and to see. Um, and this, this next book goes back to one of the most terrible of high school rituals that I actually don't know if they do anymore, and I really hope that they don't, um, which is dissecting a fetal pig. The memories are not good, so here's a poem about it. Biology. Fetal meant that the pigs hadn't even been born. We named them after our algebra teacher, after our English teacher, after our biology teacher himself. It was funny, ha ha, right? The lidded eyes pale, having neither seen nor been lit with light. No one cried over them, though Mary Beth retched her lunchroom hand after Jeremy put his hand up her skirt, whispering like love, you know who you're eating. Ha ha, it was funny, right? We were serious as scalpels. We were sharp from spine to tip. We were only just then learning that destruction is the root of all knowing. 
Were we monstrous? Were we anything before we became what we were taught to be? A cutting edge beneath the skin, and then the glorious cleaving of muscle from tendon and bone. I can still smell it here on my hands, formaldehyde blurring the shock of pool water cologne. Some nights I dream of a pink sleep anesthetized. I dream I was an eye that was never forced to see. I feel like every boy in high school or my high school wore cool water for a while, so. Um, a lot of my poems come from uh, listening to NPR because I'm kind of addicted to it. Um, and this poem starts there. And um, some of the things that you need to know, um, I mentioned Karen Uhlenbeck, who's the first woman to win the Abel Prize, which is basically like the Nobel Prize for mathematics. And her field of study is just gauge theory, which I do not understand, but from the Wikipedia version of it. Um, it's a field of spatial geometry that studies fields like gravitational fields um, and holds that it can't be, they can't be directly measured, but you can measure what's around them and how they react to other fields. Gauge theory. On the radio, Karen Uhlenbeck says that the thing she wishes people understood about mathematics is that it is beautiful. When I hear her, I am inside of my body, inside of my car, calculating the miles it will take to take me to work. In this way, I am always calculating, counting the years through which this body has moved, how they gravel my voice, how it is beautiful, isn't it? to wonder how many more years you'll move through because you'll always want more of them, more scratch pollen, more eggplant, more the morning rush hour sheen dimmed. I use my hands to tell the radio to be louder, to tell the car left, left, then right. I want addition, I want. This equation is difficult to describe because beauty should be difficult to describe. Lately, I've had a conversation with myself, which is at its heart about accessibility. Say it plain, I say. Say, in the summer of my 33rd year, a doctor removed from my body the organs that carried my capability to reproduce. Do not say on that day I, began, I both began and ceased to live as the person I knew myself to be. Do not speak about the self in terms of an immeasurable field. Do not speak about knowing in terms of spatial geometry. But the body is an object, even if I deny it. Even if I become very good at denial, it still marks itself with the passage of time and in the same ways as a mountain does, doesn't it? Forever an ascent and then forever a descent. When I say I have opened my eyes and given my attention to the divinity that is darkness, when I say I have moved inside of time and its rooms and found darkness but not divinity, what is it I should try to explain and why again should I? The body is an object measurable only by its own metaphor, which is time, which we try to pack neatly into the numbered parcels that glow at us from lighted screens. In the office of living, I have found difficulty to be its own divinity, which is the word we use to mean an awe we can't express or contain. I move this body through a field and over the unnumbered grasses who know all and nothing of time. How can I tell you? In my 33rd year, I became an answer to all of the questions I began with an if. There is still an everything, the ecstatic bliss of knowing. I will never understand. Just one more here. It's shorter and there's no math, I think. Ariadne after the thread. Who was that girl in the maze? too busy being a needle to understand she was also an eye. 
all bothered heat, all light the underside of a storm cloud scraping the city with its silver. Some of her is left in me, lipped into the marrow, caged beneath ribs. Is she this blunt thumping? And if so, where did the sharp of her go? I'm an eye without a point. As you grow older, the gods who needle me say, it grows within you. The search for more ever, for some young other, a body in which the years haven't deaded and ended, a labyrinth. And if the soul owns anything, it is no red thread. There's nothing to learn from a needle but piercing, nothing for the eye to do but open and then close. There are the beasts we hide and the beasts we marry, and there are the beasts our bodies become as time passes, the hands that claw, the spine that shatters, the thousand sunset aches screeching that living, after all, is the most monstrous thing to be. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's not as exciting just to hear one person clapping, but I think it's important <laughs> um, to see everyone clapping, but to at least hear one person. Um, Emma, that was just breathtaking. And the fetal pig dissection poem really did me in. <laughs> um, <laughs> We had to do frogs and I've never gotten over it. Um, I couldn't finish it and I still have nightmares about it. And now I'm a vegetarian, so I definitely couldn't have done a fetal pig. <laughs> um, our next two readers are people, I'm not only gonna read their professional bio, but a little bit of praise because um, Mamie Morgan's book just came out this month and Karen Rigby's will be released um, in a couple of months. So I am very excited to introduce both of them. Um, our next reader, Mamie Morgan. In her elegiac collection, fittingly titled, Everyone I've Danced With Is Dead, Mamie Morgan's poems are exquisitely stitched as they offer up lamentation for and salutation to the dead. These are dedicatory Jeremiads against loss that flame with anger, anguish, feminism, and yes, even humor. And though they are underscored in a bladed nostalgia, they are never sentimental. Instead, they are finding new ways to feel while flinging every street facing window open. Swirling in the poetic spaces of this book are caribou, witches, and chickens, as well as cameos by Amy Poehler, Mary Oliver, and Iphigenia. But most importantly, ascending from the book's foundation is Morgan's incantation for the living and the dead, the clear and sustaining phrase, I want you alive. Mamie Morgan received an MFA from UNC Wilmington and a BA in English and religious stories from Waff and religious studies from Wofford. Her first book of poetry, Everyone I've Danced With Is Dead, is out from Jack Leg Press this month. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Washington Square Review, the Oxford American, Fish Barrel Review, Nimrod, Muzzle, Four-Way Review, Yamasi, Inkwell, The Greensboro Review, and many others. Please help me welcome Mamie Morgan. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Are we good? Um, I like religious stories as the major instead of religious studies. That was that was great. And um this is such an honor. I'm um, I'm really excited to be here and to hear Angie and to hear Karen in a minute and um, to hear my great friend Emma Bolden, who's been so kind with this book. Um, so thank you all and thank you to Simone and, and thank you to Jen. Um, I was talking with my mother earlier and she asked what I was going to read and I was like, I think something from the beginning, middle and end. And she was like, that's 
creative um, because I didn't know exactly what to do. So I, I think I too, am gonna read four poems and I'm gonna start with the first one. And um, I think I'll also read uh, one of the epigraphs uh, in the book. I, I taught at the, the South Carolina Governor's School for the Arts and Humanities for 14 years, um, poetry. And it was sort of my whole life. If you if you read this book, it's the, I, I think I write about teaching in almost every, um, poem, but one of my students, uh, Brian Joy, passed away in 2013 and while, while I was teaching him. And I had students write process papers every quarter about the, the poems they had written. And his, his process paper opened with, poetry is like seeing pirates of the Caribbean when you're not ready for it, when you're small, when you're like seven. Um, and so that's one of the epigraphs in the book and he's in the opening poem. So uh, it doesn't help that most of the poems are titled Everyone I've Danced With Is Dead, which felt really clever when I wrote the book and is now sometimes proving confusing. But uh, so several of the poems will be titled that. Everyone I've Danced With Is Dead. B's failing poetry, but he's a nice boy. Lives in his leather bomber, loves AP bio, is cool to no one. When he leans against the hand-me-down Ikea chaise in my office, says, it feels like a valley. We're a valley everywhere. I make him a copy of some Simic poem about Euclid and chickens and light-dressed women carrying parasols. And Saturday morning before they find him, I dress in a black gown with cutouts, careful to keep the tags intact for a pageant I've entered at some Baptist church. My dad carries a sickness so small in his Merkel cells, we haven't even met it yet. Everything's a joke. For weeks, my boyfriend Josh and I practice our show walk up and down the carpet, make smoking ladylike, the both of us over a trill of my school issued iPads, toddlers and tiaras. Josh's casual walk is killer. It's 2013, I don't remember anything else that whole year. I hear Josh is a welder now and has like a hundred babies. I bet he's burned so many things back together. Um, and the, the second poem, shockingly, is titled Everyone I've Danced With Is Dead. Um, it, it becomes more ridiculous as you like say it out, read them out loud. But, um, and this is about a friend of mine who, who passed away a few years ago um, from a fentanyl overdose. Hours before they identify him, Garrett DMs me the recipe for perfect eggplant parm. Everyone knows, he begins, you salt the skin. When the vision started, they started small so you couldn't tell. Was it skag or too much brown liquor or maybe left entirely alone, the banisters of his mind filled during a matinee of long days between jobs. Everyone knows you slice lengthwise. Garrett's duplex so short a drive from mine that when he called, I often showed up barefoot and purseless, often flinched at the sound of my own finger tapping his glass door. All you need to know is the last time a gaucho knife he clutched above the fox. Brown, dead, small as a leather loafer my dad used to beat down a roach or wasp's nest from any wall. Whether he found it, whether he killed it, whether Garrett put it out some misery never mattered, I never asked. You can tell grown folks are about to go when they begin to look like kids again. The trick, he says, is sauce. And I imagine him typing into his galaxy both handed, a new port buoyed against the still lake of his lip. Use half what they tell you, maybe even half of half. And I assume by they, he means our grandmothers and the women we called our grandmothers who weren't any kin, but helped in cleaning us up, beating us good, shipping us out. And there's this sort of like postscript to the poem that's in a parenthetical. Maybe what you need to know is how we met. 
summer after fourth grade at sleepaway camp named for Cherokees, though every last counselor was white. Ours, a teen who wore shark's teeth around his neck and looked nearly like a grown man or God, who once as punishment dropped Garrett and me in the middle of the Agawatia forest for days with only one apple, said, take this, eat it core and stem. Don't think of coming back till there's nothing left of you. Um, and so just two more. I learned right before this, we started that my friend Hannah is in the room. Um, I can't see her, but I know she's here. And um, so there's a poem in the book for her that I wrote during the 2016 election. You'll be delighted to learn it is not titled Everyone I've Danced With Is Dead. Um, letter to Hannah from the cafeteria during first lunch at the art school where I teach. Oh, and Amy Poehler is in this poem um, from Parks and Rec. I don't know. I didn't know if that reference would keep. It might not. Um, I just want Amy Poehler to be happy. Island exiled and rich as that morning you arrived. Unprecisely edged in a black bathing suit. And we lay by the apartment pool reading translated Neruda. And when we showed up at the foot of, I no longer love her, that's certain but maybe I love her. You squealed and the belly chain wearing you around the waist blazed like sometimes here the vocalists do and the ballet dancers, but never the cellists or weirdly the animation kids who carry their heroes around inside screens and slate gray portfolios. Anyway, she split again, Amy. And I'm not saying perhaps this Us Weekly article isn't even saying that a man has anything to do with anything. But how about the time you schlepped the hours long drive to my duplex carrying a case of cheap pink wine and an intro to Spanish CD that was stuck in your player converting, you had been skinny, now you are fat. That couple is not using protection all the way down I-95. I hid beneath the dining room table fisting hymnals of grass because the dining room table lived for a few bad nights after he left in the yard. Your man had ridden a double named girl along Carolina Beach Pier like a song nobody's ever cared about. Same place where Billy Worthen once hummed, when you were mine, thinking of another while I stripped upright on a yellow towel. Back then, I let just about anyone have at me. The Pope, Michelle Obama, millions readying for mass on our school television, administration bought so that the student body can witness the closed caption of hell our country's in. Back when that Pope shoveled as a bouncer in a Buenos Aires club where someone once blew a gun up my mother's dress. Think of all he could have done, but didn't. I want to be at work on a poem when I die. The same night whitening the same trees. I want it to be like that. Before you broke came the book you wrote and in it a sun and in it the mean snow. And on hot days, I carry them both around in my belly instead of you. My father's dying, which is why I'm writing, which is why at 1111, I kiss the face of my iPhone to undie him. He's a globe, he's a nightlight in the shape of a conch. He thinks this election might kill him worse than what'll kill him which is the weight of what we keep asking of him, which is to stay alive, which is what I'm asking of you as well. It's all selfishness over here, like any letter that has nothing really to do with the beloved. I want you alive. I want you stitching all the frayed hairs on my head into a single smart wreath, making promises the way all girl children do when they're alone just before a man comes in to switch off the lights. Um, and the last poem is the last poem in the book. And um, I wrote it in homage to after one of my students, Sophie Young, who's a, a brilliant student, a brilliant poet, also a brilliant student, but um, it is unfortunately titled Everyone I've Danced With Is Dead, um, after Sophie Young. Even winners can die reports the headlines, and in the supporting role of photograph half a dozen ball-capped women, I mean, ball-capped men, shower Arcadius with bags of keg party ice. It's 2012. 
I'm three months pregnant. The dads bought me a black stoned ring from Dixie Jim while his real girlfriend labors across town. And all I crave are buttered green beans topped with slivered almonds my mother served some Easter's. I haven't even miscarried in the den of a party and apologized for it yet. Sophie is 10 and I won't become and won't become my favorite student for years. She's never written a poem where the horse dies on all her televisions and a kid in her class snorts so much pixie stick. She sent snotting orange to the nurse. The poem's about what we can hotwire, more about what we can't. The last line goes something like, it's been an unusual year for the girls. Thank you so much. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. So very real and wrenching. Wow. Um, brings up a lot of the past as well. On a humorous note, sweet pink wine. Mine was Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill. <laughs> of course it was. Of course. <laughs> we could have a whole poetry group around um, the horrible alcohol we drink as teenagers. Yeah. Thank you for that reading, Mamie. And please do... Um, get Mamie's book. It is just superb. Um, I highly recommend it. Thank you. Our next reader um, and our final reader is Karen Rigby. Karen Rigby writes with, quote, fingers cocked like a gun. Deliciously inventive in its linguistic unfurlings, fabulosa fibrillates with noir and glitz in these strange seductive poems that are in conversation with a range of players from Dior to Endeavor Morse to Hieronymus Bosch. Shimmering with diamond cut precision, Fabulosa underscores Rigby's observation that, quote, I never write without measuring each line, hooking a quick silver hunger, end quote. There is no bloat in this book. It is exquisitely hewn. Underpinning the collection is a keen interest in cinema, fashion, feminism, transformation, and textuality, from ars poeticas to portmanteaus to ekphrastics. Seamed with gold shine and darkness, we find in these fireball poems a wilderness glance through the bull's eye. And as the title suggests, it is absolutely fabulous. Karen Rigby's latest poetry collection, Fabulosa, is out this summer from Jack Leg Press. Um, I think it's out in June. Her debut poetry book, Chinoiserie, was selected by Paul Hoover for a 2011 Sawtooth Poetry Prize and described as poignant, powerful, and urgent. She's a 2023 recipient of an artist opportunity grant from the Arizona Commission on the Arts. And her poetry is published in journals such as the London Magazine, Poetry Northwest, the Oxonian Review and Australian Book Review. Please welcome Kieran Rigby. Hi everyone. Thank you, Simone and Jen, and also Angie, Emma, and Mimi, and all of you for being here. This first poem actually owes a debt to Angie. She has this great poem called True Confessions, which features Rita Hayward. Very obliquely, you'll see a reference near the end. Why my poems arrive wearing black gloves. Like twin gauntlets set on the margin, enter the female assassin, the screwball debutante, noir and glitz mixed in one bad throwback to an age when dahlias hold anyone who breathed them. My poems arrive wearing satin or suede to haunt you when they leave no trace. I've watched a man pull off his gloves 
with his teeth. The trick to undoing the wolf behind the saint is to make a slow-mo invitation of it. Because there's never a plot unless one of us goes missing. That's me at the aerodrome and you boarding a custard plane. Now fly at the sultry wind before you vanish. That's the tension we need. I love an overblown image, a drawer full of hands wave in a solemn motorcade. My gloves pantomime moods so thick you could ladle gravy. About my first book, a critic wrote, I'm a little bored with the aesthetic. If that isn't damning, what is? My poems wear black to turn the dials and bag the ice. In the director's cut, I'm driving the hairpin curve when the camera rolls back to show you, looking louche but alive. You are always in on it. A poem is a diamond heist. Tell the critic no one watches a woman enter a room to look at her hands just like no one's reading this poem to picture my life. That a black glove heal down the avenue of my arm. What wouldn't you do? This next poem is inspired by a painting by William Adolph Bouguereau. And it features a woman who is wearing only one glove and the other glove is missing. Lady with glove. Color of ginkgo, maybe citron, puffed sleeves, I notice first. Then her sideways acid look, an ungloved hand props up the other gloved hand. Whether she's set to take the lone glove off or roll the missing one on, it's all invitational for blank decolletage. Picture the coup, the lure of unfinished action. No necklace, no background, except for the black sky or unlit parlor. Who knows where this is happening? I'm doing what history warns us not to, inserting myself in the frame so that her bloodless smile has little to do with neoclassical beauty, but the second before or after the crime. She regrets nothing. I regret less and less. In a parable of love, a brute steps into an orchard, doesn't come back. Once, a woman with opaline skin wore a malarial dress, fingers cocked like a gun. Whether she took the lone glove off or rolled the missing one on, the painting is fabling a crosswind in the trees. The Bar Suit, House of Dior, 1947. After the war, the wasp waste returns. Silk civility, a flag, romance, buttoned up jacket, over pleated wool. Dior's vision of flower-like women is made in armor of glamor. Boning and yardage dazzle even now, a study in minimalist color styled with Luke's hat and heels. Who doesn't love the regal criminal feel of leather gloves drawn past the wrists, terrifying in their strictured elegance? The year an editor crowns Dior's collection as the new look, the doomsday clock debuts on the cover of Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. The hand aims seven minutes to midnight. Inside meringue and black couture, the spleen builds its own reactor. The future arrives in leonine steps. The future pivots, all of us witness, a magician's wife home from the void, mouthing, it's nothing, nothing. This next poem is inspired by poet Lynn Emanuel. She has this funny poem called The Politics of Narrative, Why I'm a Poet, which is basically about why it's so difficult to write prose. So this is my response to that. On the failures of plot. As in the square cordoned for storybook rhubarb, each furrow pillowed. As in to lose to memories short circuit. As in the ribbon flying off when you open a grimoire, Consequence, tying me to the tracks. Ground plan or secret, noun or verb, plots pedestrian. I was born, I lived, I cried. 
I'm terrible at tackling holes. I'd rather ink horses with a wolf brush. The trouble with destination is that nobody loves a maze sewn in kudzu. Forget what happened. Why write about plotting when it's the after I'm after? I only liked ornithology for the field guide's jeweled plates. My favorite poet said, end with an image. In Bangkok's gutted New World Mall, boy bloom between a column and escalator. The page is a roofless ghost ship, a pool glinting orange, blots just a daymare. And the very last one, Tangelo. Who doesn't love a portmanteau for tangerine and pomelo? Or more like angel, tango, words for wilderness, how I like planting you, Peter, in the thick of it. Also known as Honeybell, the peel lifting off like a capelet, the poem a long path for getting at the flesh, its obdurate slickness. A tangelo's not a metaphor for anything, which is why I love its simple divisions. The pith, a lacework or dragnet. Where I'm from, Aviv's photo of a bleeding vice president. Guillermo Ford in his Guayabera, bludgeoned by gangs of the opposition, went viral months before the invasion of Panama. In 1989, savagery seeps through what we know. The Tangelo's no ritual, but it's as good as anything when it comes to hooking the past through the eye of the present. I can let lightning stitch my lip or forget a country with dead dictators it's not the shape of a world that counts. It's the scent in my closed palm. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I feel like I need to go have five minutes alone and have my feelings <laughs> because all of those poems were so powerful in so many amazing, unique ways. Um, what beautiful words from what amazing women. So thank you all sincerely for your generosity of time and your generosity of your heart and your spirit for committing to writing such authentic, incredible words. Um, they're just so powerful. So thank you sincerely. Um, this year, we usually just do one poetry reading a year, but this year we have a series going on. So we're very excited about that. Um, so we have a couple more po poetry readings this spring. The first one will be up in Mar on April 25th, and the second one, May 21st. Um, there's an Eventbrite site, so I hope you uh, sign up for each unique event. And we'd love to have you join us again, um, because, again, more incredible writers are joining us, um, both Jack Lug authors and other authors who, um, again, give of their time and energy and spirit that we want to celebrate. Um, we really believe at Jack Leg that everyone's worth celebrating. And so we really try to focus on that and build community because let's face it, writing is hard. And so when we can come together like this and celebrate each other, it's just the best thing ever. So thank you sincerely. And we really look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, we'll share this out on social and feel free to share it with whomever you want, or you can find it on YouTube, or you can email me at info at jacklegpress.org.com and uh, I'll be sure to send it to you. So thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you, thank Jen. You. Thank you so thank much you. for bringing us all together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.